السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على نبيه ومصطفاه وبعد My dear viewers welcome to another live edition of your program Gardens of the Pious Today's episode by the grace of Allah is number 329 and it will be the first in studying chapter number 91 which is known as باب الوعظ والاقتصاد فيه الوعظ literally means preaching الاقتصاد means to be moderate so this chapter deals with being moderate in preaching not preaching all the time but rather every now and then every once in a while whenever you feel that the audience are willing and are ready to listen to your preaching so if we ever talk about al-wa'ad, preaching, reminding, then right away it will pop up. It will pop up before our eyes the very important ayah of Surah Az-Zariyat, in which Allah the Almighty reminds us of the importance of preaching and the reminders. Allah the Almighty says. وذكر فإن الذكرى تنفع المؤمنين ذكر remind so remind means that the person the audience may already know the information maybe he know it maybe he knows it very well but he needs to be reminded of it and this is the nature of the human beings they need to be reminded Sometimes we know things by the heart and we memorize them but we need to be reminded. Al-insan is the Arabic noun of the human being, mankind, insan. And the name of the human being is derived from nisyan which is forgetfulness. So we are in constant need for reminders who would benefit out of the reminder the believers we're already believers but we still need to be reminded so whether prophet muhammad or those who succeed him of his ummah in conveying his message they need to keep reminding one another because the reminder will definitely benefit the believers. May Allah make us amongst them. Remember, brothers and sisters, the very quality which made this ummah superior to the rest of the ummah is the quality of enjoining what is good and forbidding what is bad. at reminding, is also some sort of enjoining what is good and forbidden what is bad. A tazkir or the reminder is like the water for the plants, for the trees. Without irrigation, they will never grow. Even if you have a grown up tree, look at the drought which is, and the famine which is striking Somalia and other parts of Africa. May Allah the Almighty have mercy on them and may Allah send them beneficial rain. Ameen. What happened to the trees? What happened to the plants? They all died because there is no water. The hearts are like the plants, the trees. They're grown up, but they need constantly to be irrigated, to be watered, to be moistened. The irrigation and the watering of the hearts, similar to the trees, is the reminder, reminding one another. 
uh, it could be one of the great companions and he will forget then one of his companions will remind him we constantly need a reminder may Allah be pleased with him complained about something that he experienced which he described as nifaq this is how he perceived it when Abu Bakr al-Siddiq may Allah be pleased with him asked him what is wrong he said I feel myself being a hypocrite said why do you feel so what makes you think that you are a hypocrite he said whenever we're sitting in the presence of the messenger of Allah peace be upon him and he will remind us of heaven paradise hellfire to the point that we feel like we can actually visualize them so when he speaks about paradise and what Allah has prepared for the believers in it we feel like we are in heaven and we can see it whenever he speaks about hellfire the severe torment that Allah has prepared for the wicked and for the non-believers we're afraid of, of it we're afraid of committing sins because it feels like we can actually visualize it okay then when we leave we mingle with our family members we manage our businesses we get busy with life nasina kathira and we forget a lot we forget because we get busy with other daily activities Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu anh said if this is what you're complaining of then me too I have the same problem they both went to the messenger of Allah peace be upon him and they discussed this matter with him Abu Bakr said listen to what Hanzala is saying what did the messenger of Allah peace be upon him say he said sallallahu alayhi wa by Allah if you remain in the same condition in which you are in whenever you're attending the halqa, the dhikr, the reminder, the maw'idah, the preaching, indeed the angels would descend from heaven and then they would shake hands with you while you're walking in the streets and while you're reclining on your couches and your beds. Why? Because that means you maintain 100% stability on the straight path you always do what is good you always abstain from what is bad you're infallible you're as pure as angels but we're not angels we're no angels we're human beings we forget we need to be reminded then once we're reminded we repent and we come back on the right track and so on and so forth so al mawaidah the reminder the preaching, the admonition sometimes is of a great importance. If the person is not being reminded, then the person may go astray. The greatest ayah and the greatest reference with regards to the methodology of reminding, the methodology of preaching is ayah number 125 of surah an-nahl the honeybees marvelous ayah if we ever speak about da'wah preaching reminding admonition then we have to make mention of this ayah ud'u ila sabili rabbika bil hikmati wal maw'idati al hasanati wa jadilhum billati hiya ahsan إن ربك هو أعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو أعلم بالمهتدين. O Muhammad, peace be upon him. أدعو إلى سبيل ربك. Invite to the path of your Lord with wisdom and kind preaching. And argue with them. In the best possible manner. Indeed, your Lord knows best who has strayed from his path, and he knows best who is the guided ones are. 
May Allah make us amongst the lerar party, those who are truly guided. This ayah, as I said, brothers and sisters, is the cornerstone in the methodology of da'wah because it covers all the different categories of the invitees. The audience are either believers and they need to be reminded. So, invite them with wisdom. Maybe they are sinners and they need to be apprehended. Then, bil al hasana. Maybe they are non believers or straight parties and you need to argue with them, وَجَدِلْهُمْ but still with one which is best. Why? First of all, the word al hikmah. Al hikmah means wisdom. Some people said al hikmah means the knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah and all of that. But guess what? Some people have memorized the entire Quran and they have learned a lot of ahadith, but their way of preaching is very offensive and repellent. It was of people. They don't want to listen to them. And it makes people insist on straying away from the straight path. They are lacking hikmah. The first segment, ud'u ila sabili rabbika, invite people to the path of your Lord, bil hikmah. In Arabic, the letter ba in the word bil hikmah is known as ba'ul musahaba. Yani always in every condition you give da'wah, you remind, you preach, you must use hikmah. Whether you are talking to Muslims or non-Muslims, you're talking to believers or non-believers, practicing or non-practicing. Bil hikmah al ba benefits continuity, musahaba, all the time. So whether you're giving maw'idha or whether you are arguing whenever you have to, use the wisdom. What is the meaning of using the wisdom? And what is the wisdom? Allah the Almighty says, يُؤْتِ الْحِكْمَةَ مَنْ يَشَاءُ وَمَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Allah the Almighty grants al-hikmah, wisdom, to whomever he wills. And whosoever is granted wisdom, then has been indeed granted a great deal of goodness. If we look into al-hikmah, the wisdom, which is advised in this ayah, while giving a nasiha, or giving a maw'idha, preaching, or reminding, the Quran is mixed ayat, of exhortation, ayat of severe warning, bashiran wa nadira, and this is basically the duty of the messengers. The Quran doesn't have the same rhythm. And subhanallah, the same number of times in which Allah the Almighty addressed Al Jannah, He addressed An Nar, heaven and hellfire are being addressed in the same number of times, equal number of times. Reward and punishment. Likewise, dunya and akhirah, the life of this world and the hereafter, likewise. So it's keeping balance. And again, while talking to the audience, use your best wisdom to see what does the audience need most, he or she or they. Sometimes a person will throw the book at the audience. Somebody is not praying. Okay, you don't pray, you're a calf. You don't pray, you go to hell. You don't pray, you do this and this and this and that. So basically you are severing every connection between this person and his faith. You already made him a calf. And perhaps he was in need for a better reminder. Like um, whoever observes the prayer on a regular basis, it will be a nur and a burhan, a proof, and, an, and a light for him on the Day of Judgment. A salah would solve all your problems, will relieve you from your misery, because it connects you to Allah the Almighty. 
You know why you're so depressed? You know why you're overwhelmed? You know why you cannot sleep? You know why you're having insomnia? Try to pray. Try to connect to your creator. Try to talk to your maker and all of that. So this way, that's called exhortation. Targhib. Try this first. People are not alike. There are people who, whenever you, you frighten them, whenever you keep warning them and threatening them, you ward them off. You repel them away. And there are people who like to hear the words of exhortation. Subhanallah, when the people came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and said, um, ask Allah the Almighty to destroy Thaqif, a tribe who fought against Muslims in the Battle of Hunayn and even before. And they said, Ya Rasulullah, they have hurt us a great deal with their arrows on the battlefield. They tried to besiege them, but they used to light fire in the arrows and shoot the arrows from their bows so that it hurt the Muslims. The Prophet وسلم, said, sure. Then he started making dua. Allahumma hadi thaqifan. Oh Allah, guide them. Guide them. They are murderers. They are criminals. And we're asking you to pray against them, to ask Allah to destroy them. He made dua. But instead of asking for their destruction, he asked for their salvation. He said, Allahumma hadi thaqifan. Allah the Almighty answered his dua. And they came willingly. They accepted Islam and they became amongst the believers. In Allah yuhibbu rifqa fi kulli shay. Allah likes kindness and softness in everything. And obviously in preaching, in giving da'wah, it is more worthy to be kind, to be gentle, to be nice than any other, in any other thing. When the person is given the khutbah and the audience some of whom are tired, some of whom are overwhelmed, some of whom are experiencing whatever difficulty in their lives, and you throw the book at them, you will talk about hellfire, the punishment, and people who will be hung from their feet, and people who will have this and this and that. You make the audience feel like they want to leave as soon as possible. They cannot tolerate you anymore. So al-hikmah must be steady and must be accompanying every preaching, every reminding, whether you are addressing Muslims who are good doers or sinners, or you're talking to non-Muslims. And sometimes debates and argument is prescribed. This is whenever it is either imposed upon you or whenever you are in a position where you have to defend your faith, refute misconceptions, we don't sit back and we say, ignore them. No. Maybe they misunderstand. They need to refute their misunderstanding, their misconceptions. And the solution is there. So in this case, if you have to argue, then argue with one which is best. So al-ihsan is prescribed in the ma'asiyah, in, in, in the case that you are preaching a person who is a sinner. In preaching a person who is a non-Muslim, in preaching a person who is very argumentative, a person who is a sinner. In the hadith, the Prophet وسلم, said, there used to be two people from among the nations before us. One, two brothers or two friends, two companions. One is very righteous, a devout worshiper. And the other is big time sinner. So the worshiper keeps advising the sinner. And he would say, Rabbi. Leave me alone with my Lord. He will forgive me and all of that. As many of us say sometimes. Until one day, the worshiper saw the other person while committing a big sin. He could not tolerate that. So he said, I swear to Allah, Allah will never forgive you ever immediately Allah the Almighty collected their souls he sent the angel of death to collect their souls then he revived them resurrected them then he said Man is to take an oath in the name of Allah who 
dares to say, I swear that Allah will do this or Allah will not do that. Do you have an access to Allah directly to know what would he do? So he said to the worshiper, he swore in my name that I shall not forgive him. Okay, I forgive him all his sins. And he says to his angels, he said to his angels, take him to paradise. What about the worshiper? <laughs> Did not accept any of his good deeds because of the crime that he committed of being judgmental of others' fate, which he have no access to. Only Allah does. Even the messenger of Allah said, I don't know what is going to happen to me or to you. Now you decide who's going to hell and who's going to heaven. So this is a typical example. And this is very, very important. Um, I love the, the story of the two grandsons of al Hasan. And Al Hussein, the grandsons of Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, when they saw a grown up man was performing wudu and he did not know how to do wudu proper. They're young and he's grown up, he's so old for them. How would they approach him? How would they tell him that, hey man, shame on you, you're an old man and you don't know how to make wudu? So very interesting why. One of them approached him and said, Uncle, me and my brother are having an argument. Who makes wudu better? The same wudu that the Prophet ﷺ does. So he volunteered to look into their wudu to judge who does a better wudu. But when they both performed ablution, the ablution was identical. So the grown-up man realized that it was a very nice way of preaching. He said, both of you are right and I'm wrong. Message is delivered. What matters is to bring people into the pen of faith, of Iman, not to word them off. Inna minkum munafireen. There are some people like that who word people off, who push them away through the way of advising, giving harsh advices, very repellent. When people ask for jidal, for a debate, it must be done in an academic way, on scientific basis, not out of emotions. Look how Allah the Almighty presented a very nice argument several times in the Quran. Look. يا أهل الكتاب لما تحاجون في إبراهيم وما أنزلت التوراة والإنجيل إلا من بعده أفلا تعقلون The people of the book the Jews and the Christians were arguing concerning Prophet Abraham peace be upon him So the Jews said that Abraham was Jewish and Christians said that no he was Christian Look how Allah the Almighty refuted this argument in one hit, swiftly. He said, well, وَمَا أُنزِلَتِ التَّوْرَاتُ وَالْإِنْجِيلُ إِلَّا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ The Torah and the Gospel were revealed way after Ibrahim. So how do you claim that he was following either the Torah or the Injil or the Gospel? They came hundreds and thousands of years after Prophet Ibrahim السلام, then the best way of giving da'wah is presented in the previous ayah and this is how the Prophet وسلم, used to preach and invite the people of the book to Islam قُلْ يَا أَهْلَ الْكِتَابِ تَعَالَوْا إِلَىٰ كَلِمَةٍ سَوَاءٍ بَيْنَنَا وَبَيْنَكُمْ أَلَّا نَعْبُدَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ say O oh people of the book come we all together should come to a just word, not to worship other than Allah, and not to associate with Him any in worship, not to take one another as it is instead of Allah or besides Allah. But if they turn away, if they don't accept your advice, 
if they reject your preaching and your da'wah, just tell them that we'll bear witness that we are Muslims. We're not going to force you to accept faith. This is a message that we delivered. Ma ala rasuli illa al The duty of the messenger is just to deliver the message. Also, in Surah Al-Baqarah, second chapter of the Quran, أَلَمْ تَرَ إِلَى الَّذِي حَاجَّ إِبْرَاهِيمَ فِي رَبِّهِ أَنْ آتَاهُ اللَّهُ الْمُلْكِ A tyrant king. Allah the Almighty gave him domain, kingdom, plenty of wealth. So he assumed himself the creator. And he claimed that. He claimed to be the Lord. And he ordered his people to worship him instead of worshiping Allah. And not only that, he claimed that but he argued and he argued extensively because the word hajja is an extensive form and that's why we prolong it mad lazim kalimi muthaqqal six counts and by the end there is tashjid alam tara ila alladhi hajja ibrahima fi rabbihi he was so argumentative He is the one who began. What did Ibrahim السلام, say in reply to him? Ibrahim, peace be upon him, said, My Lord is the one who gives life and causes death without any hesitation, with full boldness. The tyrant king said, I too, I give life and death. So Ibrahim السلام, realized that he is talking to a dumb person. He's king, but he's dumb. Because how he proved that he gives life and death, he freed a prisoner. He said, look, I freed somebody whom I could have executed. And he executed another. قال إبراهيم فإن الله يأتي بالشمس من المشرق Well, Allah is the one who brings the sun every morning from the east. Who do you switch and bring it once from the east to prove that you have an access to the creation? So the disbelieving king was utterly defeated and Allah guides not the wrongdoers. There are many beautiful examples whether in the Quran or the Sunnah how to argue with what Allah the Almighty said وَجَادِلْهُمْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنْ Argue with one which is best. But for now, brothers and sisters, we're going to take a short break and we'll be back, inshallah, in a couple minutes. Please stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back, dear viewers, to another episode of Let's Talk on your favorite station, Huda TV. I'm your host, Yusuf Kroma, and today we'll be talking about the very crucial topic of maintaining trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have someone who's a perpetrator in your family, you could encourage him to go to therapy, uh, to seek help, seek help from others, uh, like adults in the family who are trusted and they have trusted opinions and they could help them get out of this. So it's not sufficient for a person to utter the words of tawakkul, but in reality he doesn't really feel tawakkul in his heart. If a wife lost a husband, then it was to, to the son to decide whether she can get married again or not. So uh, it was pretty much just, just the men controlling the thing. So when Islam came, it, it kind of gave the rights and gave uh, the explanation of how of the word family. How did he treat his daughters w when they were in, in a younger mm. age? And I found that there's not hardly anything reported about it. root 
of category is one of these seven people who will be under the shade when there is no shade but Allah's shade on the Day of Judgment. Colors of, uh, you know, Arabic language, uh, you know, uh, explain the word, the meaning of the word Haya. They said, it's the fear of something uh, that's shameful. At the same time you try to solve your problems, then you will see the results. And the advantage is sticking to the Sunnah. When you stick to the Sunnah, that's when you see the advantage. But could you elaborate more? What do you mean, sticking to the Sunnah? It's a lot of, you know, major sense because the problem is that they convince you, they try to convince you by saying, Wallahi is the best, you know, Wallahi it is the best, you won't find like, anything like it, you know. So you, you're going from a sin to another sin, to a greater sin. Man, it's been over one hour, I'm waiting for you. Okay, bro, it's not a big deal. At least you should have called. Oh, not again, don't get too serious. <laughs> So let's get inspired, let's get motivated to worship Allah in the best way. Let's get motivated not only to worship Allah in the best way, but to race to do good deeds. Join us in this program, Islamic Motivation by your brother, Rayyan Arab, exclusively on Huda TV. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. I would like to remind you with our phone numbers, uh, they should appear on the screen as well. Area code 002 then 1331 or 132. The email address is gardens at huda.tv. The first hadith in this very interesting chapter, chapter number 91, Al Mawa'idatu wal Iqtisadu fiha, preaching and preaching moderately, is a hadith which is agreed upon its authenticity, narrated by Abu Wa'il Shaqiq ibn Salama. He's one of the great tabi'een. May Allah be pleased with him. Um, actually, he died on the year 64 after the migration of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was a student of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. May Allah be pleased with him. That's why he is the narrator of the hadith um, of the dialogue between him <coughs> and Abdullah ibn Mas'ud and others. An Abi Wa'ilin Shaqiq ibn Salama qal Kan ibn Mas'ud radi Allahu anhu yudhakiruna fi kulli khamis faqal lahu rajulun ya Aba Abdul Rahman lawadittu annaka dhakartana kulli yawm faqal أما إنه يمنعني من ذلك أني أكره أن أملكم وإني أتخولكم بالموعظة كما كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يتخولنا بها مخافة السآمة علينا متفق عليه وائل, ابن ش... وائل أبي وائل شقيق ابن سلمة May Allah be pleased with him narrated that Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, used to preach us on every Thursday. So, uh, one of the audience, one of our tabi'een, said to him, Ya Aba Abdul Rahman, and that is the kunya of Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, he said to him, Lawaditu annaka dhakartana kulla yawm. I wish you can preach us and give us the ta'leem on daily basis. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, Indeed, nothing prevents me, nothing stops me from preaching you on daily basis other than the fact that I'm afraid I will bore you. If I ever give you the preaching or the classes on daily basis, you may get bored. Then he remarked saying that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to يتخولنا بالموعظة 
used to preach us every once in a while whenever he feels that the time is convenient and we're ready to receive the preaching or the advice he used to do that while we would love to hear from him day and night and after every prayer because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was afraid that we will get bored out of preaching would anyone ever get bored of listening to the messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam well I warn you yourself to imagine that the messenger of Allah peace be upon him used to choose the right time whenever he feels that there is a need and the audience are ready he would not just talk and talk and talk every day and on every occasion no sometimes he will pray fajr and turn around <coughs> and give a khatra preach and give an advice sometimes it may be afternoon it may be after asr or maghrib and sometimes the the ta'lim would last after several prayers but he was not constant on daily basis and after every prayer why he used to fear that we will get bored sallallahu alayhi wasallam that's why his student abdullah ibn mas'ud after he migrated to iraq most of the companions of the prophet sallallahu wasallam spread all over the earth in order to convey his message in his farewell speech sallallahu alayhi wasallam said falyublighi ash-shahid minkum al-ghaiba let those who are, are present today convey my statement convey my speech convey my message to those who are not here and so on and so forth so each one should convey the message of Allah and the message of the messenger of Allah peace be upon them once they have a chance but it is not something that you shove down the throat of the people they have to take it all at once like when somebody is invited to give a speech or he is um, maybe it's his job is an imam of a masjid to deliver the Friday sermon so he prints out a khutbah online he prints it and he starts reading for half hour for 45 minutes he's just reading there is no spirit in it people are not only bored some of them are fully asleep and the other are half asleep and everybody is not comfortable because there is no spirit in it he feels he is doing a duty in order to get paid that's his job it shouldn't be like that brothers and sisters it should be bil hikmah all the time you prayed fajr you recited some beautiful ayat they touched your heart as an imam or as a reciter you turn around you just realize that mashallah today is Friday people are off today is Saturday people are off Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim I'll give a khatra for a few minutes people are sitting are willing to listen fine it shouldn't tempt you to start doing this on daily basis and after every salah because some people may be sitting because they are embarrassed to get up and leave they're shy and they may end up not coming to the prayer because they think that you're tying them up if Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam used to yatakhawaluhum bil maw'idah used to preach every now and then every once in a while not on a regular basis and the only reason he's full of informations he's got the whole revelation he can talk to them all the time but the only reason why he did not do that on regular basis and on every day because he was afraid that they will get bored would the companions ever get bored of the Prophet ﷺ? this is a human nature brothers and sisters we have seen this some of the very famous scholars whom people would love to meet in person even once in the lifetime after the Arab Spring in the past seeing those people was not an easy mission and to attend a class it was a challenge because once they get a permit 
or once you have a chance it is once every few months now masajid are fully open I'm talking about after the Arab Spring and the scholars are everywhere and they're preaching 24 7 in the first few days people were very motivated very enthusiastic to attend the classes to listen to the point that we have seen tens of thousands of audience in some of these meetings then afterward they slow down why because it's available every day you go here you go there you find the sheikh the sheikh it's available they started losing interest they flip the channels they have all the shiuch available so in the past they used to pay for the tape for the cassette for the cd in order to listen to it and they would listen to the rerun over and over and over not anymore why because they got bored it's available all the time assalamu alaikum warahmatullah sister fatima from the ksa Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Gardens of the Pious. Fatima, do me a favor and mute your TV, please. Talk to me from Is your handset. Can you read Surah uh, uh, Yasin and Surah Al-Waqiyah uh, daily? Can you read Surah Al-Waqi'ah daily? Surah Al-Waqi'ah in Yasin daily. Okay. I got your question. Can you read Surah Al-Waqi'ah and Yasin daily? If you want to, fine. But if you read it because you think that there is a hadith that says if you recite Surah Al-Waqi'ah every day or every night, you will never be poor, that is not true. So you recite it because you've memorized these surahs, you love their meanings, and you want to recite them day and night, no problem. All the Quran is the word of Allah the Almighty. It is true that there are some surahs which are superior. The greatest surah of the Quran, Ummul Kitab, the mother of the book. The greatest ayah of the entire Quran, Ayat al Kursi. There are some surah, chapters of the Quran, which have specific verses. Surah Al-Mulk to be recited every night because the Prophet ﷺ recommended so and, and so on. So if you want to recite Surah Al-Waqi'ah or Surah Yasin as many times as you want without thinking that there is a, a specific virtue for reciting it on daily basis, no problem. You can go ahead and do that. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud narrated the Prophet ﷺ as saying, Recite the Quran for each letter you recite, Allah will give you a hasana, and each hasana will be rewarded ten times more. So for each letter you recite, you receive ten good deeds, whether of Surah Al-Waqi'ah, Surah Al-Fatiha, Surah Al-Nas, or any chapter of the Quran. So now we were talking about how the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, uh, used not to preach on a regular basis, rather discontinuous. Whenever due to his hikmah sallallahu alaihi wasallam would sense the audience are willing to hear and they are excited to hear from him sallallahu alaihi wasallam also there are some cases emergency emergency call and somebody did something terrible somebody made an error uh, like this companion who went to collect the zakah and he received the gift so he kept it for himself and said this is your zakah and this is for me. It's urgent. I have to address not only him, not only few people, rather the entire ummah, because this is a very important lesson pertaining to what? Pertaining to rishwa, bribery. So this gift is not a gift, rather it's rishwa. I've got to be serious. And sometimes his face would turn red because the situation requires so to deliver the message properly. The three companions wanted to compete with the Prophet ﷺ with the gods to do good deeds in order to be with him in paradise. The Prophet ﷺ did not approve what they did even though their intention was good. He gathered again the Ummah and started addressing all of them. Indeed, I'm the messenger of Allah, I'm the dearest to Allah, I'm the most God-fearing of all of you. Yet, 
I fast and I skip fasting some other days. I pray at night and I rest and I sleep and I am married. So whosoever turns away from my traditions, he does not belong to me. Based on the needs of the audience, based on whether your talk and your address will benefit them right now or not. So this is very important, brothers and sisters. We learn from Abdullah ibn Mas'ud. And obviously, Abdullah ibn Mas'ud have enough information to keep talking on a daily basis. But he followed the strategy of his teacher, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. The following hadith is narrated by Abu Al-Yaqdhan, Ammar ibn Yasir, may Allah be pleased with him and his father. He said, Sami'atu Rasool Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam yaqul, inna tula salat al-rajuli wa qisara khutbatihi ma inna tum min fiqhihi fa'atilu salata wa aqsiru al-khutbah rawahu muslim. Ammar ibn Yasir, whose nickname is Abu Al-Yaqdhan, May Allah be pleased with him and his father. Narrated that I heard the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, as saying, the lengthening of prayer and shortening of the sermon, of the Friday sermon, is a sign of the man's deep understanding of the deen. So prolong the prayer and shorten the khutbah. The word na'innatun min fiqh, a very prominent sign that this man is well versed and has a deep understanding of the deen. What do we have here? We have the sunnah of the Friday prayer. To recite, not lengthening the prayer to recite Surah Al-Baqarah or to recite Surah Al-Ahzab, now the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to recite sometimes in the first rak'ah Surah Al-A'la Sabbi Hisma Rabbika Al-A'la and in this case he will recite in the second rak'ah after reciting Al-Fatiha Surah Al-Ghashiyah not long sometimes he would recite in the first rak'ah Surah Al-Jumu'ah and in the second rak'ah Surah Al-Munafiqoon but his khutbah would be brief his khutbah would not be very long you can do that in the dars, in the ta'leem, in the halqa, because the audience would have the easy access to leave once they have an emergency, or once they have an appointment or work to do. But for the Jumu'ah, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam listed the, uh, the, the following adab. That we should go to the Jumu'ah as early as possible. So some people have been sitting for hours. And the least, you should enter the masjid before the imam. So any of the attendees have at least entered the masjid before the imam. And the Prophet ﷺ ordered to listen attentively to the speech. To the point that no salam, no greeting. And if somebody says, Assalamu alaikum, and greets us while we're sitting in the masjid, we're not going to reply to him while the Imam is giving his sermon. And if somebody is talking, it invalidates his Jumu'ah. And if anyone were to tell him that, Sih, Uskut, Ansat, be quiet, that would invalidate their Jumu'ah too. That means we're captive audience, yes indeed. Because the khutbah should be brief and short, so that the message is delivered, very precise. The Imam should prepare the khutbah so that the audience will benefit of his brief and short message, which is full of wisdom. Versus when the person is not prepared and he keeps repeating himself and he goes over and over and over and people get bored, so they hate it. So the sunnah, as the Prophet wasallam said, it's ma'innatun min fiqh. Some... Uh, um, you know, imams deliver the khutbah an hour and a half and two hours. No. The khutbah should be brief and the salah should be as the Prophet ﷺ used to recite maybe Al-A'la, then Al-Ghashi in the second rak'ah or Al-Jumu'ah and Al-Munafiqoon. Preaching actually is a science. 
which is known as the methodology of preaching or methodology of da'wah. We still have many ahadith, inshallah, to benefit out of the guidance of the Prophet sallallahu in the methodology of preaching to be continued, inshallah, in the next episodes. Until then, I leave you all in the care of Allah. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. رسول الله حبيب الله الله our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he born in humans to be the best and give his best religion to them Allah our God is the greatest the one and only glory to him he born in humans to be the best and give his best religion to them So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about him in paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling the best with the cheapest price So why did they ignore that? Forgetting all about hell and paradise Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price